Yeah, hey, I've been a good morning, my relatives. It is uh, Tuesday, um, April 25th already, and I'm sitting down with my second cup of coffee, and I'm very excited because I'm going to have a conversation this morning with uh, Daniel Imervar, who is the author of an incredible book called How to Hide an Empire. And I had a chance to meet Daniel a few months ago when I was uh, speaking at a conference at Northwestern University, and he graciously agreed to join me for a second cup of coffee. And so he's going to be here with me in just a few moments. But before I begin, I want to do as I always do, which is acknowledge I'm speaking to you from what's now called Washington, D.C. But these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. I want to honor the Piscataway as the host of the land where I'm living. I want to thank the Piscataway for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to just state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. So um, I want to thank you, my relatives, for joining me. Let's see who's online with me this morning. There's usually a few people jumping on right away. Susan Yacht, hey, thank you. Good to see you so uh, early this morning. Let me bring on Daniel, and then we'll get into our discussion. So Daniel, good morning. It's so good to see you. Good morning, Mark. It's good to see you, too. Um, I have a confession. I'm not drinking a second cup of coffee. I'm drinking a second smoothie. Is that okay for this? Time? You know, that is not only okay, it's actually a great reminder because I'm drinking my cup of coffee right here, but I usually like to have a smoothie three or four times a week, and I haven't had one in about um, three or four days now. So you I do. actually need you to do. make my smoothie yeah. um, later this morning and get that going for myself as well. But um, yeah, I hope uh, I thank you for reminding us all to be healthy. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad you could join me with your smoothie with you. So, Daniel, you're, you're a professor of history at Northwestern University. You've written this incredible book called How to Hide an Empire. Is there anything else that you want to just say or how else you want to introduce yourself as we get into this conversation here? No, that's it. That's it. I'm a professor at Northwestern University, and I wrote How to Hide an Empire. Okay. Well, um, uh you know, when I, I, I found your book almost by accident because um, for a long time when my book came out, On Selling Truths, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery, it was cat classified in um, Amazon under the category of um, colonialism, post-colonialism. And uh, I noticed a lot of days, or a lot of times when I would see it on there, your book was right around there. And your book um, obviously has been out for a while. It sells really well. And I saw, I kept on seeing this book on my Amazon feed of uh, How to Hide an Empire. And so finally I decided to, I should look into it. And I, I read a few reviews about it and I bought it. And the experience for me of even just reading like the, the introduction and the first chapter of your book was just kind of mind blowing, right? Because you start immediately with um, the, the story around Pearl Harbor and you completely shift the paradigm of what all of us have been taught in history. And you demonstrate how, um, you know, Hawaii wasn't even, the major uh, military accomplishment by the Japanese that day or in that, in that week. And you completely just flip the tables on how we understand that part of our history and that era of our history. And then it doesn't just stop there. You go on throughout your book, chapter after chapter of bringing in these different stories that are just like, none of us learn these things in, in college or in high school. And um, so I, I want to, first of all, thank you for writing your book. Um, it's it's a complete eye-opener for myself and many, many other people. Um, I promote your book pretty much everywhere I go. But I would love to hear a few stories about, because I'm sure, right, you didn't grow up learning these things. There must have been, was there something, was there one thing you learned that kind of triggered you down this path? Or was there something that, um, that what motivated you to write this book or to do this research and then was there any point where you kind of learned something and you just had a pause and say, I just need to emotionally digest this before I can even begin to deal with it? Yeah. What was your experience of doing the research and putting this book together? Yeah, Mark, thanks so much for that, for all those uh, comments. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I should start out by saying um, I'm a white guy who grew up in Pennsylvania. Um, and the, you know, the idea that the United States was an empire was something that didn't didn't really come up a lot for me. I mean, there were people who were critical of the United States and sometimes would call it an empire, but um, I wasn't didn't feel uh, like I was really close to the imperial dimensions of the country. Um, and I studied U.S. history. I was getting a doctoral degree in, in, in U.S. history. I was interested in U.S. foreign relations. And then I went to the Philippines um, researching something, something else. And when I got there, you know, I'd known that the Philippines had been a U.S. territory for about 50 years because I was getting a PhD in U.S. history. You're supposed to know that kind of thing. But no one had really cared to talk about that much. Like I hadn't, the implications of that hadn't been particularly stressed. And then I actually got to the Philippines and I was spending time in Manila and I immediately saw, oh, this place has clearly been part of the United States. The streets are named after U.S. presidents. The transit system is based on surplus U.S. army jeeps. Uh, th there are streets named after presidents. Uh, sorry, as presidents, but like I go to the college and and you know like everyone there would be speaking English with roughly the same accent that I have, and it, it just was like a moment when it just I was like oh like how how have I not been thinking about this as part of the United States uh, and part of U.S. history? And then once you have that thought, you know. You, you suddenly are asking questions about Hawaii and Alaska and Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And and I, I just I realized I've been teaching history wrong. Um, I've been teaching U.S. history and it, and it always has been the history of the contiguous blob. Um, and it turns out that that's part of the country, but that's not the whole part of the country. And um, and then so once I was writing the book, it was just a kind of a series of like, oh, my God. God, why didn't I know this? Or why wasn't I talking about this? Or like, oh, this seems huge. And like, how has this not been part of my conception of US history? That sort of, oh shit, like, I can't believe I didn't know that moment just kept happening to me again and again. We can talk about some of them, but but that was the feeling that I that I had, you know, in the many years when I was working on the book. And then hopefully that's that's a feeling that I can transmit a little bit when I was writing it. Yeah, I, that that sounds so reminiscent of my experience. You know, I would say for, for you that you talk about the day you were you were in the Philippines and you just kind of realize this is a part of America, right? This is a part of the United States. For me, it was uh, two of the, the most pivotal chapters in, in On Selling Truths is discussion by Abraham Lincoln. And as a Navajo man, right, where our, our people endured the horrors of the Long Walk, which was the ethnic cleansing of our Dinete land in the Southwest, and I was, I had already uncovered a lot of Abraham Lincoln's blatant white supremacy. And I, I so I, I was already aware that he was a very broken man. But I've always blamed the long walk on Kit Carson, who was the army captain who went through our lands and ethnically cleansed them. And I was preparing to talk at, it was in February, at a, 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 it was a speech um, for the poor people's movement. I was given two minutes to talk. This is during February, during President's Week, President's Day. And I thought, if I have two minutes, I'm going to deconstruct Lincoln. And so I was sitting in my basement, pondering what to say, wasn't reading anything, wasn't studying anything. I was just pondering what I was going to say. And for the first time, my brain connected that the long walk happened during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. And he was actually the mastermind behind the ethnic cleansing and genocide of my people. And I've always, my whole life, I pictured, right, I pictured Kit Carson as the person who was delivering these horrors to our people. And that morning, that, that picture was replaced with Abraham Lincoln. And it just, it blew my mind, right? It just, I had to just, <laughs> it just, it stunned me because I had never thought about our history and especially about that president that way. And since then, the research I've done, right, and, and you and I have talked some about this, but it's completely transformed um, the way I even talk about our history. And it, it's no longer about, yeah, we, we had these problems and we're growing out of them. It's no, we actually still celebrate some of these things that are deeply genocidal, deeply dehumanizing. In fact, we call one of our most genocidal and white supremacist presidents our greatest president. So what does that say about who we are as a nation? Um, and so, yeah, so that was something that, that for me was very pivotal and I, I can 
identify very quickly with what you're saying about your trip to the Philippines and kind of seeing that for the first time. Well, and Mark, I want to talk about that. What you said was, you know, for me, the moment of revelation with Lincoln wasn't a new fact. You knew when the long walk had happened. You knew when Lincoln was president. It was it was putting them together and putting together facts that don't always go together. And I certainly found as a U.S. historian that once you add the um, overseas parts of the United States to the story or the kind of non-states to the story, um, you, you do learn new facts, right? You learn things you just absolutely didn't know really that I didn't know. Um, but a lot of it is just sort of, you know, moves the books onto new library shelves and sort of reorganizes all, all your knowledge. And a lot of what's really powerful is is recognizing those connections. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, and I, I think one of the things that I kind of a, a, a saying I started telling myself because, right, I had been lecturing on a lot of this stuff. I knew a lot of this stuff. And I was as I was writing the books, I was digging deeper. And the thing I kept telling myself, because it was so true, it's like every time I dug deeper, the history just got worse, right? It just, it's like the more I dug, the worse it got. And that was the experience of, of reading your book, right? Because you started digging into some things I've never dug into. And I was just, as every chapter of your book, I'm just like, holy crap, what are we? I, there's one chapter in your book, um, I forget, chapter 13 or 14 maybe, where you talk about the building of the highway through Canada up to Alaska, and not only the unjust way it happened and the completely way it happened with disregard for the environment and things, but the impact and that what that road had and what it did to the native Alaskan, the people living in those lands was horrifying, right? And then the, the atrocities that happened, and you you talk about this a lot in your book where you, you, you speak frequently about Alaska and Hawaii and the way that they were during World War II, the atrocities that happened there as they were under martial law, as they were under military governance, and just the things that, right, we heard about things with the internment camps, but what was kind of happening on the ground behind some of this press blackout that you discuss yeah. was horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, so part of the interest for me as a historian in studying empire was just seeing a, a side of U.S. history that um, felt unfamiliar to me and is not the kind of thing that I'd been used to teaching in, in my classrooms. But it's a dark side. Um, empire is a terrible form of government. And um, and most of, not all, but most of what you see is um, really uncomfortable surprises um, if, if you're not used to that kind of thing. So it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Alaska is often you know, can, perceived from the lower 48 uh, or from the U.S. mainland, you know, as sort of a, a joke, you know, it's like it's, it's sparsely populated relatively. Uh, it's, it's, it's really cold. So most of the jokes are about how cold and rem remote Alaska is. Um, and there's very little sense of the imperial history of Alaska. Um, it is a settler colony, uh, and it and it has been. And a lot of Alaska's history has to deal with um, settler native relations, and and that extends absolutely through World War II, including um, when the United States, at the same time as the United States, is running uh, an internment of um, people of Japanese ancestry, which is considered one of the sort of historical crimes, one of the few things for which the United States has um, atoned and, and paid reparations. Uh, it is also um, uh, interning Alaskan natives, not because of any suspicion that they are aiding the enemy, uh, just because they are inconveniently placed. And it, it's, it's easier uh, for the US military to um, um, round people up take them from their homes, put soldiers in their homes, so now the soldiers have somewhere to live, and then just to send them to these these camps where the death rate is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and that just, that's like, sort of passes below the historical radar for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, that that is so true. You know, I, I point out a lot, and I've learned and I, I point out in some of my work that Alaska was discovered, just like the U.S., or Turtle Island was discovered, but it was discovered by Russia, right? They are the ones who claim the right of discovery over it. And then that right was purchased um, by the U.S. Um, from, from the Russians. And that's how that they took the sovereignty over those lands. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think reading those chapters in your book and, and then, I mean, the thing it, it made me think about is especially World War II, it's so easy to frame that war and it's been framed in our minds as a war between good and evil. And I do not deny that the, 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 the Germans, the people who were fighting and the Japanese were doing evil and they were doing these horrific things. But as you point out, even in, so in one of your chapters, you point out the complexity of what happened in Japan or not in Japan, in the Philippines Right when because we actually lost that land during World War II, that during the same bombing raids that that took place in Pearl Harbor, they also bombed the Philippines and they took over those lands. And right, we had our Japanese people in internment camps in the Philippines. Yeah. And then when the land when that land was taken over by the Japanese, right, this the they were looking at the American imperial powers as the enemy. And for the, the Japanese people living there, we actually were. We were mistreating them. We were, you know, all the, the white supremacy that was taking place here in the U.S. was very evident in these, in these uh, territories we had around the world. And it makes the, the distinction between who was good and who was evil in that war much murkier because of the things that we were doing while we were actually, you know, trying to win this war. Yeah, so I um, wrote a piece in The Atlantic a while ago about this. Um, the common frame in the United States is to see World War II as the good war. And the reason it's a good war is that it's a war against Hitler. Like, what, what better just cause could you possibly have? Uh, and along with that frame is come two things. One is, uh, an assumption that really the war is about Europe. Yes, there's a Pacific theater and yes, the United States fights Japan as well. But basically when we talk about the war in the United States, we're largely talking about um, a war where the center is Europe. Uh, and then once you have that sort of, once you're looking at Europe, it looks like a war to defend sovereign nation states against um, thugs who want to invade their territory. Um, because if you're just looking at Europe, that's that's what it looks like. Uh, if you take a larger global view, you see that, I mean, first of all, these are not sovereign nation states, these are empires. And a lot of the causes of the war have to do with a conflict between incumbent imperialists um, like Britain, France, the United States, uh, who have you know, spread out all over the world comfortably and would like to maintain that, and insurgent imperialists, uh, Germany, Japan, um, Italy, uh, who've been locked out and would very much like to horn in and, and, and claim their own place in the sun or a larger place than they've had. Uh, and so you, so you both see the motives of the war have a lot to do with the sort of insurgent imperialists trying to claim the colonies of the incumbent imperialists. Uh, and then the actual fighting of the war, a lot of it takes place in colonies and the fighting is absolutely unhinged. And you see that in the United States. I mean, it's, it's crazy that we don't focus on the war, the fighting that the United States does on its own soil in the Philippines. Japan uh, takes and temporarily occupies the Philippines. The United States takes it back. Uh, but that back and forth in the Philippines, which is a U.S. territory, is extraordinarily costly and it is partly costly because the United States commits itself to tactics that will preserve the lives of uniform mainlanders, but will do enormous collateral damage. So it just bombs its own cities and it shells its own buildings in order to um, sort of efficiently, while protecting the lives of, of U.S. service members, um, defeat Japan. But the cost of this in uh, Filipino lives is enormous. Yeah. In the four years uh, of the war, which is about, it's about the same time that the United States fights a civil war, um, uh, there are the, the the overall fatalities for that conflict in the Philippines. We think are 1.5 million people dead, and 1.1 million of whom are Filipino. So that's the bloodiest event that has ever happened on U.S. soil. That is two civil wars, uh, and you know, find me a U.S. history textbook that talks about that at all. Yeah, yeah. Just like you're not going to find a history textbook that talks about Lincoln as a genocidal president. Yeah, no one, because no one a, yeah, I mean, 
Because U.S. history, to a large degree, is a history of the United States conceived as a nation state and then understood to the parts of it that sort of conform to that expectation. So yeah. literally the like, where is the United States of U.S. history is, you know, uh, is, a, is a portion of the United States, but it's not the portion where you see all this kind of stuff happening. One of the points you make in your book is the the distinction we how we how we make and think about the United States as right this continent of forty eight states, um, and then you have another map. I've seen other maps associated with your books yeah. where you say no, the empire, the whole empire of the United States is actually much broader, yeah. and it has a lot of little territories and 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 satellites all around the globe. Yeah. And yeah. of course you end, you know, we, we both have talked extensively about the fact that we have over 800, um, you know, military bases stationed throughout the globe as well, which is also you, you point out as part of our empire and our empire building. But yeah, I, I like how you focus and I really like how you brought out the, the picture we have of the 48 states and yet that's not even close to what is the actual territory of our country and our imperial reach as, as a nation. So um, to write this book, I had to learn how to make my own maps. Um, and the reason I did is that the maps that um, I saw weren't the maps that I corresponded to how I was trying to think of the, the country. Um, it's really hard to find uh, a map of the United States that includes places like Puerto Rico on it. Uh, it is even harder to find a map of the United States that includes places like Puerto Rico and includes them to scale at an equal area projection. So you can actually see like how big Alaska is, for example. Um, so the map that you're referring to is a map that I had to make myself. And once I did that, I saw that the part of the country that the, 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 the place that we normally just call the United States or America is quite clearly a part of the country. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a big part, but like, once you see the Philippines, Alaska, and you know, everywhere else sort of arrayed on the map too, you can't think that that's the entirety of the country and everything else is a footnote. You realize that a lot of the population and a lot of the acres lie outside of that, of those contiguous borders. Yeah. Um, there's so many things I could go into here, but one of those things I also want to talk about, you're a professor of history at Northwestern. I was on campus about two or three months ago, speaking at a student-led conference there. That's where you and I first had a chance to sit down and talk. Um, but uh, I asked a few of the students at the conference I was teaching at about you and if they knew you, and you seem to have a fairly good reputation on campus. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, right, because I'm certain what you write about is in the content of your classes. Yeah. So what kind of reaction do you get from your students as you take them through? And again, it's not just one or two lectures. I would imagine it's your entire class, like every week, twice a week or three times a week, you're kind of shifting their paradigm. What kind of reaction do you get from the students as you take them through this history? Yeah, so I teach two classes, uh, big classes. One is a global history class, and you walked me to my door as I was about to teach a, a version of that, or one one session of that. Uh, and I teach a U.S. foreign relations class, which traditionally is sort of the diplomacy between the United States and you know far distant uh, countries. But the way I do it, it's you know U.S. indigenous relations, it's you know U.S. colonial relations, as well as you know U.S. French yeah. relations. Um, and sometimes what I say sort of tweaks a student the wrong way and it violates their political sense of how the world is, especially if we talk about World War II and I make an argument that World War II was largely a war about empire. Um, you know, they might say, oh, my grandfather fought in that war. Are you telling me that? Um, yeah. But, you know, that happens sometimes, but it, that's not the main reaction. What I find is that students at Northwestern are really interested in this stuff. Um, they are, they have a sort of training already from, from high school that makes them see the United States in a certain way, but that doesn't mean that they're politically committed to only seeing it that way. And I think um, that feeling that feels so important to me and you, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't know that. My paradigm is shifting, you know, scales are falling from my eyes. Like that, that's a great feeling. And um, my sense is that undergraduates love to have that feeling as well. Yeah. Um, I'll also point out that we're in a weird political moment where college age students 
really depends where you go. But but o- overall, are far less committed to any version of American exceptionalism that you know past generations would be. You can see this in opinion polling. Um, young people are just do not believe anymore, yeah. uh, by and large, that the United States is exceptionally virtuous or is fundamentally different from other countries. Um, so I, I I get a lot of, you know, I hadn't seen it that way before, which is fine. Uh, welcome to college. That's what we should be doing. Um, but I don't get an enormous amount of, you know, I refuse to see it this way because it violates. My country. Yeah. Yeah. I, I So that reaction you just described of, you know, how can you frame the war that way? It was not a war of empire. My grandfather or some family member fought in the war. I would get that. In fact, I do get that a lot whenever I, I preach or whenever I teach yeah, this history. Yeah. And we it was so much I I started observing that I was I, I started remarking that I was observing what appeared to be like trauma in my white audiences. And the thing I, in my audiences, and the thing I noted, right, the people who would push back the hardest as I laid out this history that people had never heard before is that the most vocal and the most disruptive pushback I got came from white military or law enforcement Christian male um, uh, attendees at my lectures. Like those were the people who were going to, if anyone's going to stand up in the lecture and call me a liar or approach me after the lecture and say I was wrong, it was going to be a white Christian male military or police veteran. And I had to understand like, why is that happening? And I, we could, I, I've written extensively about what I call the trauma of white America and the multi-generational, um, uh, uh, um, manifestation of a perpetration induced traumatic stress, but one of the things I recognize is in that demographic, right, your white Christian male military or police force veteran, is these are people who signed up to defend and fight for this country and even have or at least agreed to take a life if it was necessary in that endeavor. And they never once questioned the moral implications of that because the belief was always, this is America, I'm fighting on the good side. And so when you lay out evidence that America is not necessarily good and our battles and our wars aren't necessarily moral, that causes them, it creates a moral dilemma in them that they've never had a face before. They've never had to think about, you know, they would all say, I would never fight for Hitler. I would never fight for, you know, those things. But then when you frame America in that same way, suddenly now there's this moral dilemma that they've never looked at before. And so, as I point out, it's easier to stand up and call me a liar than it is to deal with this new moral reality that you've never faced before. And so for me, that was kind of what brought me down the path of, 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 trying to understand more what was behind what I was observing as trauma in my white audiences. Um, yeah, that, that sounds right. I mean, so I, I said that from college students and particularly college students at Northwestern, um, they're very happy to get into it. They really are. Um, but I talk to a lot of people and I do get hate mail. Um, and it tends to be from the kind of demographic that you're singling out. It's sometimes hard to tell, but people do sometimes identify themselves as retired officers or something like that. Um, And, you know, I want to affirm the, the ability to sacrifice that, that I think marks people who, you know, sign up for the military. Like it is amazing to, to have something and think I will, I will sacrifice my life. I will endure enormous hardships for my community. I mean, that, that's an instinct and that's a commitment and that's a, capacity that that I find really admirable. But you're right. If you say, ah, the thing for which you are making all these sacrifices is actually a perpetuator of harm, that's a very challenging thing, right? Because then the whole logic of like, I was willing to really give so much for yeah. my community, uh, then that gets tweaked and and challenged in a really, you know, I, you know, in a very upsetting yeah. way. Um, so so I, I, I'm not surprised to hear that. I, I will say this. This was very interesting to me. When I was working on the book, 
um, we're, I think we're now in a moment in the United States uh, on, the, on the mainland where there's just much more awareness of Puerto Rico and, and other territories, but we really weren't a decade ago. And when I was working on this book, I would tell people, you know, I'm studying the United States, but but maybe not the parts of it that you're familiar with. And, yeah. I, you know, I'd say, well, I'm actually going to go to do some research in, you know, the Philippines and Hawaii. Uh, and often the response that I get from people on the mainland would be like, oh, yeah is Guam part of the, like, like just, just bafflement, right? Just the, like the general, and that's okay. That's how we were raised. Like, I get it. But the people who were like really ready to get specific with me were people who were in the military because they'd been on all those places. Like yeah. the, the, the colonial circuits are the military circuits. That's yeah. where all the bases are. And so it was really great to have like, you know, people in the military, like really, they knew something about Philippine history in a really exciting way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, I I love your book. I have to say, I will continue to promote it wherever I go. So um, nice. It is, it is. Uh, I'd love to at some point co-present a lecture with you or something. I don't know. I'd love to find a way that we can kind of bring these two narratives together because yeah, yeah, so yeah. much of what I'm doing is about how the church is an empire, and that therefore, by extension of that, the U.S. is an empire. Um, and then your the whole thesis of your book is right. The U.S. is this empire, and and it's been hidden for so long. But we have to look honestly at what it is. In fact, I was I remember I was just listening to the conclusion. I was struck with the last the last statement of your book um, in the conclusion. I want to read it here. Let me bring it up real quick because I I found it so interesting, um, or I found it so telling. <clears throat> Your last paragraph says, territory still matters today. Colonialism hovers in the background of politics at the highest level. McCain, Palin, Obama, and Trump have all been touched by it. That may seem like an odd and surprising fact, but we should get over our surprise. The history of the United States is the history of empire. And that's a great conclusion to your book. Right. I, I, <laughs> I kept on wondering, how are you going to end this thing? <laughs> like, where are you, like, you going to take this? And it sounds like what you're doing, like what I'm trying to do, you know, I'm not out raising money or getting people to sign a petition to change. I'm like, we have to learn how to acknowledge who we are and talk about our own history in a healthy way. You know, one of the quotes I use in so many of my lectures and my writings is, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build a community, we have to start by creating common memory. And that's why I love your book, because your book, it, it's, its primary agenda is about creating this common memory that the people we've exercised empire over, the people we've colonized, all have the memory of these, hap of these events. But your average American living in the 48 states has no clue what we've done. Yeah, and that's a really important and good way to say it. So one of the things about this book that was bizarre was that for me over the many years that I you know, was sort of learning all this, it was a journey of discovery. And then I talked to a Puerto Rican friend and they'd be like, yeah, what? We knew all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, but we knew the Puerto Rican part. We didn't necessarily know the Filipino part, you know? And so it, so part of it was producing a kind of U.S. history that could be mutually recognizable um, to people from the overseas colonies or the territories of the United States and people at the mainland. But another part of it was to produce some sort of sense of shared history where the United States colonial history was was not just the history of individual places, but was a larger pattern thing. And so, you know, if you were reading this from the U.S. Virgin Islands, you could recognize your history of interactions with the United States as being part of a larger thing that included Alaska and, you know, and included uh, the Philippines. Yeah. That, <laughs> Dan, I'm sharing some links on oh, the yeah. chat now of where people can find your book. I'm sharing your Twitter handle on, on here. Um, I'm giving your bio at Northwestern University that people can can use to find out more about who you are and what you're doing. And I'm sharing a great article I read in the New York Times about your book, um, How to Hide an Empire oh, yeah. White, on yeah, American's Expansionist yeah. Side. 
Um, so yeah, I, you, I deeply appreciate your work. I'm grateful to the moment I met you, I felt like I, I had finally met, not finally, but I met another kindred spirit of someone who is trying to be honest. And you you told me before the event, um, before we went online, your last name, Imravar. Yeah. Means. Always true. Always true. Immer is always var, die Wahrheit true in Germany, in German, yeah. I love that. that. We need more truth tellers. And thank you for being willing to, to lay this stuff out and to create. And I, I'm going to, I don't know if you ever use this language, but I consider you as someone, a, a, a co-laborer, a partner in trying to create this common memory. Yeah. as a way to build a healthier and better community in our nation. So I oh, that's, a, that's a really good language. Mark, thank you so much for having me on. It's such a pleasure to get to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. All of my relatives, thank you for joining me. I encourage you to follow Daniel on Twitter. I encourage you to look up his, his get his book and, and read it. I encourage you to um, uh, find out if he's going to be lecturing um, near you or doing any kind of speeches around you. Uh, he is a brilliant thinker and uh, is doing some incredible work to help build a healthier community here uh, on Turtle Island. So Daniel, thank you very much. My relatives, walk in beauty. And may we all learn how to walk in beauty together. Hakonet.